All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Jill Buck and I'm one of the executive committee members on the K through 12 Technical Council for CRRA. Just a couple of housekeeping measures. Um, if you will mute yourself um, as you come on in, you can use the chat function for any questions that you have. Um, we'll be going uh, to the chat function and the, the questions there a little bit later. We're going to be um, joined by over 150 people today, so it's going to be kind of an exciting time, but we're really glad to have you. If you do have colleagues who were unable to make today's webinar, don't worry. We are recording it and we'll put it up on YouTube and we'll share that link with you a little bit later. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. and. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Debbie Dotson, who is also part of our uh, executive council. So, Debbie, I'm going to let you go right ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Jill. And I'm hoping everyone can hear me. I had technical difficulties earlier today. Um, thank you all for joining us. A few weeks ago, Jill and I were talking about um, how K-12 um, technical council could help right now. And we really decided we wanted to do something different than COVID and because we know that most of you are school programs are probably not going right now, but we need to look forward to the day when they are. Um, and we think this is a really good topic. We know that we, um, some of you are not from the state of California. So just real quickly, CRA is our state recycling organization, California Resource Recovery Association. Hopefully, we will be having our annual conference in August 16th through 19th near San Francisco, and I hope that um, those of you who are in California can attend that event. Um, as Jill mentioned, we are part of the Executive Council of the K-12 uh, Technical Council. It's one of the technical councils that CRA has, and we're really excited today to um, bring you two speakers who are going to be talking about um, single-service food uh, wear for schools. First, who will be joining us is Sue Chang. Sue is the Pollution Prevention Director for the Center for Environmental Health. Um, and then Rebecca Navarro is Sustainability Program Manager for Palo Alto USD. They'll be approaching this topic from two different directions, but I think that you'll um, find that what they have to say will benefit you in your school districts as well. So, Sue, I'm going to turn this over to you right now. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Can everyone hear me okay? So, um, Thank you all for having me on today. Um, I am really excited to talk about this topic and I know folks have a lot of different issues um, that, are, that have been sort of on their minds right now. I think uh, as far as our long-term sustainability and health and environmental concerns, um, this is a really important issue that, that we should all be thinking about for the long-term. So I am going to see if I can, oops. So for today, um, I am going to, you know, give sort of the overview of the problem that we see with uh, single-use food service wear, and then um, talk about some of the tools and recommendations that we have, and then we'll turn it over to Rebecca from Palo Alto Unified to talk about what they've done to transition to a more sustainable solution and then we'll get into questions and answers. Um, as far as today, you know, we were thinking that the uh, learning is are to learn about PFAS chemicals if you've not heard about them, because it is an important issue in the food service wear um, market, right? Now. And there's other concerns that we'll talk about. Uh, identifying environmentally preferable food wear, talking about making the switch, and then moving towards uh, reducing pollution and waste. So the Center for Environmental Health, we're a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect the public from exposure to toxic chemicals. And the one of the special I do in my position and my, my program is that I get to work with large purchasers and um, folks like yourselves in schools all over the country as well as many different sectors to utilize your buying power to sort of incentivize the production of more environmentally preferable products. And in this case, we're talking about the single-use food service where um, 
getting cleaning that up as well as looking for ways to move towards more preferable choice reusables. So what I wanted to start out though today was really talking about uh, something called endocrine disrupting chemicals or hormone disrupting chemicals. They're often called EDCs for short. And why we're really concerned about them is that they can mimic, block, or change the activity of our own body's natural hormones at incredibly minute doses. And they're associated with a whole host of various uh, negative health effects such as diabetes, obesity, reproductive harm, um, being to promote cancers and other diseases. And it can affect fetuses, babies, and young children, especially because they're growing and developing and, and so vulnerable at, at those stages of life. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention about EDCs is that um, some of them have been shown to negatively affect our immune systems and so make them more compromised and susceptible to things like COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So that's especially an, another reason we're concerned about the season. They're in a whole host of products and things that we're using today that we will encounter in our daily lives. So PFAS is a group of chemicals. They're called per and perfluoroalkyl substances. Um, and the reason we're focusing on those today, well, they're a group of a roughly 5,000 uh, chemicals in this class called PFAS, and they're extraordinarily persistent. They've been named forever chemicals because they have a really strong carbon-fluorine bond in the chemicals, which makes it very, very difficult to break down, and they don't, they don't get broken down by natural systems once they're out in the environment very easily. So they're found in all kind of media, in our air, water, soil, and sludge. Um, they have been shown to bioaccumulate at the top of the food chain, and um, they've been found all over the globe. So I'm going to um, now move on to talk about the fact that these chemicals are found in a really wide variety of products. So um, they're used in carpet and textiles um, for water and grease resistance or stain resistance in furniture. Uh, for the textiles, they're found in food packaging, uh, waterproof cosmetics, things like some dental floss, uh, nonstick cookware, firefighting foam is another one you may have heard about. It's um, showing up in drinking water in many communities across the country, and um, a big reason is believed to be from all the firefighting foam being used at military bases and airports around the country. Um, through both, you know, incidences that are happening, but also just regular trainings that are going on. And as far as the health effects, uh, there's been a wide range of health effects associated with PFAS in the general population or communities. Um, two of the compounds that are most well studied, um, you may have heard of them, PFOA is associated with Teflon. It's the nonstick uh, cookware. And PFOS is associated with Scotchgard, um, used for you know, waterproofing various uh, outdoor gear and products. And so they've been associated with kidney testicular cancer, elevated total cholesterol, accelerated puberty, a whole range of health issues. So that's why we're very concerned about trying to get these chemicals um, out of use and off the market. And diet actually is believed to be the primary exposure pathway um, that you know we're all seeing. Um, and it's through you know, the food as well as some from foodware. Um, and then if you're in a community that happens to have contaminated drinking water, um, that's another source. So and then it, the other concern is that there really is no easy way to get rid of this stuff once they're out in the environment. So um, 
there's a lot of folks trying to look at these issues to figure out what to do with all the PFAS that is contaminating communities and is out in the environment. But um, what we really need to do is turn off the tap and stop putting these into the products in the first place so that we don't have to try to figure out how to clean it up in the end. So um, as far as food rare goes, um, PEH went and tested a whole range of single-use plates, bowls, clamshell containers, and food trays. And we were collecting samples from purchasers that we've worked with, um, as well as gone out to the retail stores and um, did some buying online to get a range of products. And what we found um, is that PFAS is being used primarily um, in the foodware for water and grease resistance. So it's been used for the fiber-based products and that are uh, typically marketed as compostable and it can end up in the food in the compost and landfills so we have a database of all the products that we've tested which is on our website and publicly available and um, we try to provide as much information as possible to purchasers about which ones contain it which ones don't um, and try to provide much, as much identifying information as possible so that you can make informed choices. Um, so this is a summary of things by material type. And when I, I say uh, it's been in the molded fiber products, so this is made out of sugar cane or bagasse, wheat straw or wheat stock, uh, recycled paper fibers, plant fibers, and um, they have uh often you know they're they're marketed as as compostable environmentally friendly and environmentally preferable so we're um trying to get the work and the good news though is that when we first did our report and came out with our findings pretty oh. much a hundred percent of all the products we tested had pfas in it and now we're starting to see changes in the market and wow. the other one we wanted to flag is just um, really recommending that purchasers try to avoid polystyrene as much as possible or the styrofoam type products. And I'll briefly uh, touch on that or concerns about that. Um, and the reason, you know, we're very concerned about single use food service where overall is just so much energy resources um, and, and materials that go into creating these products that we may use little as uh, you know, 15 minutes and then we throw them away. And there's, um, right. in the case of PFAS and styrene, actually these chemicals, um, oops, into the food and um, hey. <laughs> we have fact out. sheets on both of those. Yeah. I'm sorry, I hear people talking in the background. Um, Where is it? But so they've been shown to, to migrate um, yeah. and then, you know, PFAS, it doesn't go mm -hmm. away. So the best thing to do is just to avoid it in the first place. So like for when? Um, so we... Sue, can you hold on for just yes. one second, please? This is Jill. Sure. Um, guys, if I mute everybody, then that's also going to mute Sue and okay. I'd hate to do that. So can everyone please mute themselves right now? Oh, okay. Otherwise, I can try to unmute myself if that works. But. Okay, I can mute everybody, and then Sue, you can unmute yourself. There we go. There we go. Okay. So um, when we when we put together our findings and recommendations for purchasers, we really realized that because of all concerns with single use, you know, there's a lot of uh, movement around the country right now to move away from single-use plastics and um, you know a lot of places are thinking that oh well maybe we can just move to fiber-based products that are compostable that'll be more environmentally friendly but still there's a lot of um, uh, impacts associated still with all of these single-use products and in this case with the molded fiber in you know, PFAS chemicals that people didn't even know were there um, for the most part, you know, a lot of folks that are purchasing these things. And so 
when we came down to it, the best recommendation is to really try to prioritize reusables as much as possible. And um, Rebecca is going to talk about all the benefits and you know their whole process in moving towards reusables. So uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is there's a great website and organization. Um, Clean Water Action has a program called Rethink Disposable, and they have a whole case studies with businesses that have gone from single use to reusables and all of the savings and other benefits that have come about making that change. Um, the thing I wanted to also point out is, as I mentioned, compostable does not necessarily equal safe or sustainable. Um, so meta compostable products, they're still using PFAS and we hope to really see the market get out of that completely. Right now we're starting the, the beginning of seeing that shift happen and alternatives are starting to come out without PFAS. And um, one reason that uh, I think also helped to make the shift is that the group that certifies these products as compostable, it's the Biodegradable Products Institute, they changed their standard, and I will talk about that on the next slide. Um, and then, you know, as far as recycling, this foodware and likely to be contaminated with food and because the recycling markets are really um, changing quite a bit and become more challenging for recyclers to be able to um, handle this stuff. You know, most of this recyclable foodware is actually not likely to get recycled. So let me just shift, oops. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, there's a group that certifies products in North America as compostable and they, um, have changed their standard to include making sure that none of these products have PFAS in them. So as of January of this year, anything on their list, if you go to their website, will not have PFAS in them and are certified compostable. There's another group that's made composters around the country called the Compost Manufacturing Alliance. They have also changed their standard um, and they field test products in their facilities, they have, I think, at least six different technologies and facilities around the country that they operate, their members operate, and will field test the products to make sure that they actually compost under those conditions in their facilities. Uh, they will uh, have their list free of PFAS by next year, by January 2021. Um, I just really wanted to quickly highlight that, you know, Green is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen, and this is one of the reasons we're very concerned about polystyrene products being used in schools or anywhere. And, um, you know, I, we have a fact sheet that has information about the science showing the styrene leaching into food or drinks from the foodware. It's very, very difficult to recycle. The um, New York City actually made a determination. They they looked more closely into it and showed that they cannot recycle, you know, polystyrene in a manner that's economically feasible or environmentally effective for for their area. And, and we it's true in most places. So six things that purchasers can do uh, if you see a product that you're interested or have a product that you're using that you don't see in our database, um, you can actually send it to us for testing. Uh, communicating with your suppliers to make sure that you're not getting products with PFAS in it is something that will really help signal to the market that they need to get these chemicals out. And we have a model letter that we can share with you all if anyone's interested. Uh, Communicating with the certifiers and either checking their lists and letting them know that uh, you support their move to make sure that PFAS isn't in these products is really, really helpful. And then um, there's model specifications if you're looking to include something in an RFP or your contract. And then I have a link to some guidance that, that co-developed with a group called the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council. Um, and then generally overall preferring PFAS free foodware and looking for ways to move to reusables or durables in the long term is really important. Um, I think 
you know, it can be challenging as far as being able to make that right away. And so some places are looking to build in plans when they're renovating a school to make sure it's designed and set up for reusables. Um, and then we're trying to actually collect information about what schools are currently doing. And um, we have a national school foodware survey where we're hoping to collect information from schools around the country about what they're, what they have doing as far as are they using single use, what kind, or are they using reusables? And it'd be really fantastic if all of you could fill it out. It shouldn't take too long and encourage others, um, your colleagues and other schools around the country to help us get this information. And um, we actually are running a small sweepstakes and have some reusable prizes. If uh, you, know, you fill it out, you have a chance to uh, win one of these products. Uh, through the end of May. So as far as the product testing, we have a form and you can contact us to um, follow up if you want to get anything tested. And I think um, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. All right. Thank you, Sue. I'm going to go ahead and make Rebecca the presenter. And Rebecca, you can share your slides and your screen. You're all ready to go. And I'm going to make sure you're unmuted. You're good. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. And great. And can you see my screen? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so first of all, thank you, Jill and Debbie and um, to the CRA for hosting this webinar. Thank you to everyone who has tuned into it. It's really exciting to see so many people on the call. Um, when we in Palo Alto started on our reusables journey, not even a year ago or just about a year ago by now actually, um, we looked all around the country to find models for how to do reusables, and it was really hard to find many people doing it. So I'm really glad to see so much momentum a year later, and I'm very excited to share everything about what we did in Palo Alto with you so that you can replicate it in a way that, um, that you can operationalize in all of your districts. Uh, as Jill mentioned, I'm the Sustainability Program Manager for Palo Alto Unified School District, which is a mid-sized public K-12 school district in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have 12 elementary schools. We also have three middle schools and two high schools, total population of around 12,000 students. Um, our reusables project at this point is specific to our 12 elementary schools. so that's about 3,400 meals a day. Um, we don't contract out much work at all in our school district. It just so happens that we do contract out um, only the director level position of food services. So we contract with Sodexo and we have a wonderful um, student nutrition director, Alva Spence, who is from Sodexo and has been with Palo Alto Unified for quite a number of years at this point. Um, huge shout out to Samantha Summer and her team at Rethink Disposable for all of the partnering that they did with us on this project. We operationalized the switch to reusables from single use. However, Rethink Disposable crunched all of the numbers for us. Um, and it was, it was as you'll see later on in uh, my presentation, it was really a lot of good news for people that need things to pencil out financially in order to get reusables in their school district. All right, I'm figuring out how to uh, advance my slides here. There should be a way in the bottom left okay. corner. There you go. I think when it's in presentation yeah. mode, hopefully. if you yeah, hover over the left hand corner. Hopefully you figure it out. Let me see if I can get it back in presentation mode. Okay. So here is 
a definition of zero waste that I want to ground everyone in. A lot of times zero waste gets talked about just in terms of landfill diversion. However, this is the definition that the city zero waste, city of Palo Alto zero waste division uses. And I think it is spot on. And I would encourage everyone to think about zero waste in terms of this virtuous circle that continues to engage the community in consumer responsibility, strengthen the economy, build community collaboration, and have products start with minimizing waste in mind. So in Palo Alto Unified, we got lucky in terms of moving away from single-use plastics because city council actually voted to ban all sorts of single-use plastic products in foodware. Even though the school district is not beholden to the ordinance, we knew that the right message to send students would be in alignment with what they're experiencing in the community. If our students um, eat out in a restaurant in Palo Alto, we want them to have the same message about the problems associated with single-use plastics that they get when they're at school. So for that reason, we thought it makes all the sense in the world to sort of ride that wave of energy coming out of City Hall and work on a ban of our own for the school district. Sorry about that. Um, so once we, once we knew that um, the ordinance was passing in, in the city of Palo Alto, we went right to our school board. I think we got um, on the very last agenda of last school year, we made a presentation um, sort of asking just for the blessing of the school board to let us go forward with moving to reusables. We hadn't done the financials yet. We didn't actually know if we were going to lose money or save money, but we did have a really high community value on moving to reusables for all of the reasons that Sue talked about, in addition to all of our beliefs about waste reduction. So for student health, and also for waste reduction, we were really interested in moving to reusables. We used the summer of 2019 to form a working group. We had all key stakeholders in our working group. We had um, someone from the city of Palo Alto. I was in the working group, our custodial supervisor, our central kitchen supervisor, our food services director. We had teachers, we had um, parents, we had everyone that we felt would have um, a hand on the success of the program involved. And I don't wanna get too hung up in like the specifics of how we figured out how to operationalize this, but that's what we used the working group to do. I think we came away from the working group realizing that um, you have to operationalize in a way that makes sense for the culture in your specific district and schools and with your uh, leadership. So I'm happy to share all about what we specifically ended up doing, but um, really I think it's best done on a case by case basis. So we didn't roll out our program on day one of the school year. Originally we thought we would, um, but we ended up rolling it out about three weeks after the start of school when we came back from Labor Day weekend. And that turned out to be a super fortuitous way to do things because we were able to use those first three weeks of school to train um, food services about their new roles, train custodians about their new roles, and do a massive educational campaign with all students and staff. And as you can see with the graphics that I've placed around um, this flow chart, keeping it fun, and lighthearted is key. We all know what it feels like to do change or attempt change in a public school environment. The more fun you can keep it, the better. So as you can see, like um, we had at all of the different uh, reusables looking as friendly as possible. I myself 
frequently was seen in public wearing this super sorter costume. Um, there were songs, there were dances, and we rolled out on September 3rd, so Labor Day of this, this current school year. All right. This um, slide is something that I pulled from the case study that Rethink published for us. I believe Sue linked that case study in her portion of the presentation. So here's where you can sort of see what how we operationalized our switch from single-use plastics to reusables. This is like a day in the life of our reusables program. So at the beginning of the day, everything happens in a central kitchen. All the food is prepared. Um, the counts come in from the elementary schools about how much lunch is needed at every site for that day. All of the lunches get um, boxed up and put in a van. They get put directly into the reusable items, sent out to the elementary schools. Students eat their lunch. They return everything to these um, return carts that we've added to the existing three sort landfill compost recycle setup that we have for students at lunchtime. Those return carts get wheeled back to the food service area and then a van driver comes around to every site, picks them up, they go back to the central kitchen, get washed, and then the next morning they are dry and ready to go out to the sites again. This is a look also prepared um, by Rethink for us of our total upfront investment to move from single use items to reusable items. So you can see here what we had to buy, what we're using it for, and how many of those we ended up purchasing. There were a few things, as you can see, that are like one time purchases, such as a drying area for um, the dishes after they come out of the dish machine. And then there are other things that we anticipate having to um, replenish a portion of on an ongoing basis. And we've sort of planned for that. Although I must say, as worried as we were about losing material in this process, by and large, students have been incredibly mindful about not breaking things and getting things back to us. It, uh, even though um, we haven't been in school for a couple of months at this point from when we started up until when we began sheltering in place we were really happy with how that aspect of the program was running so this is a general look at the return so considering all of the um, upfront costs which were around twenty two thousand dollars that I shared on the previous slide, here's what we sort of got for that $22,000 investment. As you can see, there's just been a massive reduction in the waste that we're generating on site. Um, Rethink, we, we went back and forth with Rethink about deciding whether or not to capture um, the incurred additional water use that, um, that we took on as a result of moving to a dishwashing uh, model. And ultimately we decided not to include that number in this case study, specifically because we felt that it was unfair to take a cost that had been previously externalized, meaning the water that went into all of the manufacture of all of the single use items year after year after year and sort of excuse that as something that Palo Alto Unified never had to quote unquote pay for and um, just look at how much we were using in water to do the washing. So we didn't include that. I will say though, it wasn't um, like a tremendous shocking amount of water uh, costs that we were incurring. The dish machine we have is I think a 90 second, uh, I think it's like a 90 second cycle per, per wash. So it's incredibly efficient. Um, and as you can see, the average payback for all of the items that we purchased is actually under half a year, which was a delight for us to realize. And so 
even though we had a lot of upfront costs, even in the first year, we have a net savings and that savings will increase in year two and beyond. Um, I think on everyone's mind right now is sort of all of these new truths that are swirling around uh, the state of food services in public school in California. I personally feel that now more than ever is a great time to switch to reusables, not only because health is in the front of everyone's mind and Sue did a great job of outlining a lot of concerns, a lot of health concerns with single use foodware, but also because this reusable model is a model that pays for itself in a very short amount of time. Since this case study was published, we have added reusable portion cups, as you can see on the side of the chart, and we were just getting ready to roll them out at all the sites when we closed. We ran a pilot at one elementary school. The health department approved the pilot, gave us a few stipulations, one of which was that we needed to lower all of our salad bar legs. So the sneeze guard was at the appropriate height for younger students. So we were just finishing switching out all the legs on all of our salad bars and then school closed. But we have every reason to believe that um, everything would have gone as, as well as all the other aspects of the, of the program had gone to date. In all honesty, I've worked on a lot of different types of sustainability projects in my time as a sustainability manager for Palo Alto Unified. And this was surprisingly free of worries and issues. There's almost always a certain amount of um, growing pains with any big organizational change, but this switch from single use to reusable foodware was probably the most enjoyable project I've worked on during my career. So I, I'm very enthusiastic about other people making this switch. I have a like a 90 second, maybe two minute video to show. I think the sound is gonna work, cross your fingers. Here it comes. The reusable cart program was pushed out through our food services through the district office. Its goal is to reduce trash and we have multiple Go Green clubs on several of our elementary campuses and so I think the thought behind it was to start this program in the elementary level and then hopefully move it throughout the K-12 district. It is incredibly frustrating to see single use at our schools. It's a waste of resources and it's really hard for the kids to understand where things go. Now they have something that they know goes in the ribbons. They know that it's reusable and it's a good message to set. It's working out great. Um, the district has asked us to use reusable trays, reusable clamshells for our cold lunches. Our lunches are delivered our lunches are delivered out to the kids easily. They come in, they pick them up. The best part is, is the trash has been limited immensely. The key to this is, is less waste to the landfill. 10,000 years from now, there'll be a landfill the size of North America somewhere. You use a plastic straw one time, you throw it away. You use a paper straw, you throw it away, but it gets composted easy. It doesn't wind up in the creek. I'm really excited because we're reducing a lot of plastic that's going into the oceans and ruining the habitats. I was really worried about like the turtles in the sea and like everything that would happen. Like I think I read somewhere that in 2050 that the sea would be covered in plastic. So it's really nice that you guys like made it so that like we can reuse things. They're learning that our resources are limited. They're learning that you don't just take something and throw it away after use. And it's kind of like being at home. You have a dish, you wash it. You have a spoon or a fork, you take care of it. There is so much less trash and the children have learned how to clean up after themselves. We used to have our garbage cans were overflowing with cardboard trays that we used to have and now they're gone. A fellow neighborhood school of ours only had one bag of trash after the first 
day of implementation and I said I know we could do the same or even better and let's reduce the trash and the students understand that concept um, even with reducing but also composting so this kind of solidifies it and puts the cherry on top to really reduce trash here. As the years go by you could look out and see how many paper boats we would have had to purchase for the next five years as opposed to what it costs us to acquire the green choose to reuse and wash them and if you think of what another 20 years worth of paper disposable boats would have cost and the impact of a gazillion plastic sports, it's a no-brainer. All right. Um, so we still have work to do with our reusables program and First of all, we do not have a good solution yet for a handful of hot items. Um, and if you have a good solution for us for hot items, we would love to get our hands on something that works. We've tried lots of different stainless steel containers and the items that I'm talking about are like spaghetti with marinara sauce, for example. Um, I think we have one that's like a macaroni and cheese dish. Anyway, these are things that need to stay hot from the central kitchen out to the elementary schools and when served to the students, not be too hot to touch. So um, nothing we've found for just a handful of items has worked for these hot things yet. So please, please send me your thoughts on that. We'd love to cook on site and just create a vastly different um, experience for students in terms of like, freshness of preparation, even growing the food on site and having like a garden to table experience. And our hope had been that we would use all of this uh, 1920 school year to really solidify our work at the elementary schools and then expand to the middle schools and ultimately the high schools. I think we're still going to try and do some expansion next year, but I've gotta be honest, we have a lot of work to do just to sort of stabilize all of our schools at this point, and I know I'm not alone in that. Um, I would like to mention that despite not losing or damaging most of our serving items, we did lose a fair number of reusable sporks. We have some guesses about where they went. In a lot of cases, I think um, kids that don't purchase lunch at school borrow them for their own lunches and then accidentally put them in their lunch bags and take them home and their parents aren't sure where they came from. So we had just launched this, where are the sporks campaign? Um, and I think we had put up the posters. We had these really cute wanted posters that we had put up like the week that school closed. So we're gonna try and get some of those sporks back. And um, our biggest lesson learned was branding the sporks, like property of school district would have um, would have been really helpful. I know there is draft guidance. There's lots of draft guidance about how schools will run differently when they reopen. And one of those proposals is about students eating indoors. I know in other parts of the country, um, students already eat indoors, at least in Palo Alto. And I think in a lot of California, students tend to more frequently eat outdoors. In our school district, at least, the elementary school students eat at picnic tables right outside of their classrooms. So I think this program could continue running very similarly if students had to eat indoors when we return to school. Um, but it does speak to the fact that the whatever program you figure out for your reusables needs to be something that's flexible enough to accommodate changes like are we eating indoors instead of outdoors, et cetera, and anything else that could come up. That's that's my piece. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to, I believe, Jill for yeah. Q&A. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Sue and Rebecca. We do have several questions and I'm just gonna take them in order of the way they came in. Um, we had one question and this came in during the portion uh, that Sue was giving and it asks, can you provide some references or studies in regards to EDCs? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, yes, we can, I could provide that. <laughs> 
and there's um, been some interesting articles that have come out recently regarding um, effects from EDCs and you know our immune and concerns about you know susceptibility to things like the coronavirus and other um, you know health issues that are coming up. Okay, and we've got your contact information up there, Sue. So uh, if, if folks want to reach out and get that, go right ahead. We have another question. This also came in during Sue's piece. Are we aware what chemicals are now used as an alternative to PFAS for water or grease resistance? That's a very good question. Um, one thing I do want to point out um, first is just that the uh, positive trajectory, at least right now, is that we've gone at chemical by chemical and going to looking at the whole class um, in the case of, say, BPA with the water bottles and, um, and other uses. You know, what's tended to happen is that um, the sector or industry or companies have go from one chemical that's been identified as problematic and then switch to something in the same family or class that has very similar properties as far as the function they want, but then it also tends to have similar problems and um, concerns that are related to the original chemical as well. And so in this case, we've moved out of, you know, or trying to get companies to move out of the whole class of chemicals, but um, that's the next stage is that uh, none of the companies right now are revealing what they're using instead. And, um, you know, they're going by just the FDA guidance and rules, but, you know, FDA had allowed PFAS to be used in the first place. So mm -hmm. um, to us, it's not stringent enough and health protective enough. So um, we are kind of encouraging purchasers to reach out to your uh, suppliers and manufacturers asking for them to get assessed on the um, chemical hazard or toxicity of all the ingredients that they're using in their products, particularly because it's food contact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question. Um, are the majority of plastic utensils made from polystyrene? And Sue uh, or Rebecca, I don't know who wants to take that. I mean, I can respond to some of it, although we haven't been focused on utensils. I believe, you know, they, they are uh, some that are polystyrene. I'm not sure what the majority is. I know, you know, there's a range of both uh, regular fossil fuel-based plastics as well as um, the PLA and other sort of compostable or bioplastics. And I, I've heard that in general, they're both, both categories are problematic just because it is difficult to, you know, collect these things because they're so small and sort them um, and, and make sure they, also get in the right place because they can get confused with the other type. Um, mm -hmm. Rebecca, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, you're on mute if you're speaking. I was looking for my unmute. Apologies. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> just so I can say, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, there's another question, and I think this came in, Rebecca, during your portion of the presentation. What was the key to getting custodial support for this change? <laughs> oh, gosh. I feel like I always get red in the face when I answer this one, but nobody would know if I didn't say anything because we're not sharing video. But um, I, my sweet husband of nine years is a custodian in our district, so I can usually twist everybody else's <laughs> arms at least a little bit. But seriously, I truly think, <laughs> I truly think that uh, the time you spend making genuine relationships with people that are outside of your immediate like um, sort of net network in the workplace is always time well spent. And if you have a genuine relationship with someone, they they will work with you. And it doesn't mean you have to marry them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. There's another question for you, Rebecca. What was the specific budget for this operation? 
the specific budget was that we didn't have one. It was sort of weird in that regard. Um, we had an interesting moment in time where there was so much community support in the schools and in the city of Palo Alto for moving away from single use plastics that we we sort of backed away from bottom line finances as the main metric for decision making. Mm -hmm. RCBO was ready to make the switch whether or not it penciled out because it was the right thing to do in other ways. And then Rethink approached us and said, you know, we have to be realistic. That's an awfully advantageous position. Not every school district is going to be able to do that. In fact, most are not going to be able to do that. Let's do the numbers. So we didn't have a budget. We wanted to do it for other reasons. And we were really excited that it was um, possible mm -hmm. to do it for, for anyone, really. Mm -hmm. Another question, and I, I think this is back at you, Rebecca. Did t uh, kitchen workers who did this have a positive response to this? Or did they complain about this being more work or a change to the workflow? Um, it was it, it was kind of both. Like, it was a change to the workflow. It was a ton of work. Our kitchen supervisor is a saint. She deserves so much credit for the success of this. And I think she felt the most caught in the middle because she had the director above her saying in a very sort of community facing position, everybody wants this, we've got to do this. It's the right thing to do for so many reasons. And then she sort of had everyone out at the site saying to her, oh my gosh, this is a lot of new responsibility, a lot of new ways of doing things. Like this feels a little burdensome. And we did a lot of working through it, working one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and ultimately I think gratitude goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Another question for you, are hot foods reheated in plastic reusable clamshells? No. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> Another question. Um, how does this process recognize special meals? Um, for instance, vegetarian, gluten-free, et cetera. I think um, we wash everything together. So I guess I guess that could be a sticking point if that's um, a bigger concern. We haven't had that come up from the parent community or the health department or anyone, but um, we do wash all of the containers in one machine together. Mm -hmm. All righty, and another question for you. How do you monitor to minimize loss of wares and utensils? Um, do lunch monitors, teachers, or custodians get involved with that? I think everybody gets involved. Um, and since it's an elementary school program, I think the adults on campus are already sort of on campus in the mindset of always looking out for the students. Um, so that goes a long way. But on top of that, uh, it was sort of funny when I walked the campuses, the different elementary schools, the week we rolled this out and talked to students about it. And they all thought I was crazy. They said like, we're not going to throw this stuff away. It's obviously not trash. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, kids know. Yep. Another question for you. We have lots. And I just want to say to everybody on the meeting that um, we'll get to all of them. Just stay tuned. Even though we said this would go to two, you can hang around and hear the whole thing. Another reminder that we are recording this and it will be up on YouTube uh, in a few hours. And we'll share that link if you can't stick around. So more questions. Um, do you have food share tables and how does food recovery work when the food is in reusable foodware? Oh yeah, we, we do have food recovery tables and we had to make a switch. Um, it seems to be working fine. Previously we had a basket, a very large basket. It was called the share basket and you could just put your, um, your perishables like your apple or your orange slices or whatever you had to take that you didn't want to eat in there. Now we have a share table and we have two bins with sneeze guards on the front of them. And um, one is for stainless steel cupped items and the other is for whole produce. Got it. And another question, what was the cost of your commercial dishwasher machine? Uh, we didn't see that included on the cost. We had already, we already owned it. Um, oh, okay. And I don't know the cost, it's actually kind of old. I'm sure I could pull that information if you have the contact or if the person who had that question contacts me directly, I can um I can get the the info. Okay. 
Sounds good. There were also there was another question from someone else about the estimated maintenance cost of these washing machines. Maybe that can happen by that person uh, contacting you too. Yep. All right. So another question: How much did the staff workload increase because of driving dishes back to the central kitchen and washing? Um, quite a bit. We hired a, a four hour a day position specifically for that task. So that was a new hire, uh, 0.5 FTE, unbenefited. Okay. Um, another question, did you get any pushback from the county environmental health inspectors? No, we have a food services director who is always thinking ahead, included all the right people at the health department from the beginning, documented everything we were doing, let everybody know so that it felt very transparent and not last minute. And as a result, they were very willing to work with us. Sounds good. Another question, did you see any subsequent impacts on wasted food, even if it was composted uh, before and after the switch to reusables? That's a good question. I can sort of answer it anecdotally. I know our compost service has gone down. That is due in part, probably in great part, to the fact that one of the main food wear items that we removed was a compostable paper serving boat. Um, so I have to be a little bit anecdotal in answering in terms of actual food waste. And I do know that the students were really engaged with the new reusables at the beginning, and I think it did make them eat more. Um, I can't, I can't be sure though. Okay. Um, what did the education for students look like leading up to this? Was there additional information provided on why this was happening in classrooms, assemblies, etc.? Yes. Um, I created a lot of fun videos. I pushed them out to site administrators who in turn pushed them out to teaching staff. I had this super sorter costume. I believe I had a couple pictures of it in the presentation and I wore that around to sites at lunchtime for about three weeks solid at the beginning of the program just talking it up and the kids would ask me like sing the super sorter song and we would <laughs> sing it together and you know just anything I could do to get the kids feeling like it was going to be really fun. Mm hmm. There's another uh, question. It says uh, the items in the trays look incredibly clean. Are the containers really getting cleaned and scraped out that well consistently? I'm seeing foil linings in some of the pictures. So wondering if that's part of the reason why. Also curious to know if County Health had any concerns. I think the County Health part is 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 a no. They didn't have any concerns. Um, there are, there, I think some of the pictures from early on, we were still like tweaking things. And so, yes, there is like um, a piece of foil that goes around a hamburger or something like that. There are a few items that have things we're still trying to figure out how to remove. Um, but yeah, they, they get as clean as, as clean as they need to get. I mean, I haven't seen any and ever had any concerns. Great. Here's another question, completely different. Um, where is your food vendor located? Do they serve any other school districts? And the reason this person asks is they say many schools have a contract with a food vendor that is located far away and food is prepared way in advance. Um, ours is mostly prepared at our central kitchen. Um, I think Sodexo is, is national. And I don't know enough about what things they're getting pre-prepared before they even get to the central kitchen to be sure how to answer that. But I think there's probably a way to figure it out working with whoever's involved in that particular district. Okay. Sue, we've got a question for you. Are there any PFAS in the plastic reusable plates, cups, or bowls? Um, out of the products we tested, it um, had not come up and we don't believe it's needed or used in there and okay. the plastic items. Okay. Um, and this is for Rebecca. Were there any complaints about the quote unquote dangers of metal sporks? Um, 
I think I've heard this question before with regard to the older students. We're lucky to have um, a, a sort of climate and community where that didn't come up. And so I can't really speak to to what I would say if that if that did come up. Mm -hmm. um, what about it, there's a question that says, do you think this could work in a district with 85 percent free or reduced price lunch? I think so. Um, I would probably want to involve Alva Spence, our food services director, to, to get creative on how to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe uh, the person who asked that question could reach out to you individually. Um, yes. So this is a post COVID-19 question. Are school districts likely to shy away from reusables since washing and reusing has more touch points? I think there's a general concern in sustainability right now that a lot of single use has become synonymous with feeling reassured that health is um, like more more secure. But I think there is also a lot of evidence that um, we are not necessarily safer just because we use single use items. And so I, I think It'll have to be a conversation that each school district has on its own and uses sound evidence to make the decision. And I think we just have to respect the fact right now that it's a really emotional topic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, last question. It says, are Sodexo meals already prepared readily to match this reusable system with minimal packaging, or did you have to work with them to change the way meals are being prepared at the central kitchen? We did some changes, um, but they were all sort of ordering changes. I think for the most part, we order the bulk ingredients and they're assembled on site at our central kitchen, which is at one of our middle schools. Um, but I know that, like, for example, carrots, baby carrots used to come pre prepackaged in single use plastic. And now we just get like a bulk amount of baby carrots and put them in the stainless steel cups. So we made small changes with the ordering. All right. That's the last question that we have. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank Sue and Rebecca for an outstanding presentation. We'll be doing this again soon, so stay tuned to the CRRA K-12 Technical Council uh, updates. We do that often. Debbie, would you like to say goodbye to everybody? You'll have to unmute yourself. And if not, uh, we'll close it out there. And thank you all so much for joining us. Bye-bye and have a great day.